Hey everyone, welcome back to your Donna Drones podcast. I'm Dawn Zoldai, your host and the CEO of P3 Tech Consulting. We are in December at the end of 2023. Can you believe it? And this month we are dedicating to the theme of best of 2023. And it is sponsored by Sage Tech Avionics. So we thank them. And what better way to kick off this month with some of the best of folks in the drone and AAM industries. We've got Kevin, the drone guy, Mars from the FAA and Hui Tron, who is the director of aeronautics for the Ames Research Directorate uh, for NASA. So it this has become really an annual tradition uh, where we look back on the year through the eyes of these two incredible folks and, and their agencies and what's happening in these industries and look a little bit ahead at what we might see in 2024. So welcome back to the show, Kevin and Hui. Great to be back. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Back. So you know, we were talking before the show and I'm like, oh, everybody knows you guys. But you know what? There might be like two people out there that don't. So let's go ahead and start with Hui. Can you give us just kind of that three sentence? I know that's really hard for you to do. Elevator pitch on your bio, because I know your background is so illustrious, but maybe just that brief, you know, kind of intro of who you are and what you do. Okay, so uh, my name is Hui Trang, and I'm Director for Aeronautics at NASA Ames Research Center. And my background is actually in uh, thermal protection system, or what we call heat shielding for entry, uh, entry vehicle. Um, so I work on all the Mars mission and also on um, Stardust, and, and the latest one is OSIRIS-REx uh, uh, sample return capsule. That's how I start my career. And then I moved into aviation or aeronautics. And, and since then, uh, I have been helping our folks to advocate and also doing research uh, to advance air traffic management, working with the FAA on that, and also in um, uh, UTM and, and AAM. So that's where I come from. And Hui is also a member of the Women in Drones Hall of Fame. I remember giving you that award on the stage at CES like two years ago. What a huge yes. honor that was. And by the way, everybody, if you didn't catch Hui's Full Tilt Leadership Podcast, probably one of the best of all time. So uh, I didn't, Mike, grab that link, but if I have time, I'll try to drop it and we'll, we'll get that out to the audience. Kevin, the drone guy, Maris. Tell us about yourself. So, Don, I thought we had an agreement that I would never have to try to follow up we again when introducing <laughs> my backdrop compared to hers. So this is going to be a big letdown for a lot of you. I'm sorry, because that because we is amazing. Uh, so, yes, I, I'm Kevin Morris, and I've been with the FAA for about 16 years, also known as the FAA drone guy. Uh, my career started out in aviation as a pilot, a flight instructor, later on an airline pilot, and then I came to work for the FAA as a aviation safety inspector. So I do surveillance, investigations, enforcements. Then I got into the safety side of it. I was a fast team program manager. That's the FAA's safety team. And then I worked my way up into headquarters doing some policy and regulations uh, on drones, specifically uh, the trust. And now I'm in the Office of Communications where I get to do a lot of these fun chats helping share what the FAA is doing and what we want to do with drones and how that makes everything better and safer. Yeah, I, I think there's nobody else that I can imagine being a better face for the drone industry than you, Kevin. You're everywhere. And uh, I think we might even have a couple of pictures of you out and about on the town. So there he is getting filmed. I think this one was in the Super Bowl or something. Yeah, that, that, that's me on the beach looking for drones. I'm not relaxing. Clearly, I'm in my work shirt. So that is a work <laughs> injury right there. I love that. I love that. Very good. And the obligatory selfie. Yeah, there you go. That was at uh, Sun and Fun uh, last year. Oh, that was so awesome. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about all the things you've done. But let's let's jump right into this because, you know, this is the perfect time to reflect on the year. And as you both do that, I want to focus on drones first. Uh, so what would you say, uh, let's start with you, Kevin, top three developments, issues, you know, news, anything you want to, anywhere you want to go with this in the drone industry in this past year? Well, I, I think for, for drones, really this past year in one word would be BB loss. 
but since you gave me top three, I'm going to expand on that a little bit. Okay. Um, what I what I mean by that is this year we've done some pretty remarkable things with Beyond Visual Line of Sight flying. Um, earlier this year, we issued four exemptions for operators to fly BV loss, and and why that is important is because those exemptions then pave the way for other operators to take a look at what the exemption is, how it was done, and then be issued summary grants based on those exemptions. So it really is speeding up the process for making BV loss routine. Obviously, we don't have a rule on it yet, but those exemptions really are paving the way for others to do the exact same thing, expanding drones, flying BV loss. Another big thing I thought was interesting is for drones that are doing agricultural operations. So this will refer to as part 137 or crop dusting with drones. Uh, the process to get an operational certificate from the FAA followed for a long time our longstanding process for traditional aviation. That slowed things down. It was taking nine months to a year for some folks to get their operating certificate to spray crops with drones. We streamlined that process this year. So now if you're operating a drone under 55 pounds, so essentially a part 107 type operation, you can start to get your authorization to operate in as little as 30 days. We really wow. made that process much more efficient. And I, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but the number of people we cleared out of the pipeline that were waiting and waiting and waiting for the old way to work was pretty remarkable. So we really expanded that. The third thing is kind of going back to BB loss. Um, we've always had the special governmental interest process for public safety agencies responding to natural disasters or elements that need quick response with drone action. Um, we really branched out and expanded that this year and enabled a lot of BB loss operations, which some people call tactical BB loss or shielded BB loss operations. But the bottom line is we allowed a lot more public safety agencies to operate drones in support of their mission in real time, addressing real safety and security issues. So a lot of things happened this year, but I think a lot of that focus is BB loss, which we'll get to later, I'm sure, Don, but makes me really excited for next year. No, I, I, absolutely. Lots lots going on there. I've been watching all of this throughout the year. Uh, you know, great stepping stones to really opening up this industry uh, to, to bigger and better things. So hui. Uh, you know, your focus at NASA and your mission is primarily on the research side. And I know you're doing a lot in advanced air mobility, which we'll get to in a second. But, you know, some of that actually includes drones. And uh, so as you look back on the year, whether it's, you know, through your agency's perspective or just kind of as a, a, an expert in the field, what would you say are the top three uh, developments this year in drones? Yeah, so actually, um, um, dovetail to what uh, Kevin just saying about you uh, uh, drone BV loss operations, right? I think that FAA make a really good progress on on having what we call tactical BV loss. But our our goal for our research and of course working with, working with the FAA and other and the industry is, is we trying to enable what I call routine. Uh, fly and fly BB loss for the future and be able to integrate it into the current NAS. So I think that's going to be the um, the future re that are we looking at for the future research. And that's what we, we've done. Working with the FAA, working with the industry, we just restart the, the UTM research, what we call UTM 2.0, right? Uh, the NASA done the, uh, the initial research in UTM uh, and then we ended the project in 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 2019. But now, based on the the, the demand um, uh, of the of of the integration, we come in back and we said, okay, we're going to focus the research, helping the FAA, helping the industry on how we're going to integrate this thing in the NAS. And so we start UTMB. We lost 2.0. And we actually working with the FAA under a an, uh, transition uh, research transition team. Uh, we have selected a key site. Um, we had partnership uh, with industry, and 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 we are going to start start that that research in the future. And hopefully, every year we will demonstrate technical capability of this, and eventually allowing and helping the FAA to. Um, um, 
to to be able to allow the the operation of UAS. Uh, second thing that I thought was really um, uh, powerful for 2023, and we actually start in 2022 and beyond, was the use of of drone in in wire fighting, and 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 we've been doing that for a few years now. Um, but this year uh, we had. Uh, deploy six or seven of our what we call UASP kit, pilot kit, that is uh, providing uh, U.S. forces services and wildfire community uh, situation awareness on who in the airspace operating, uh, you know, the helicopter, the, the aircraft, uh, suppression aircraft, uh, and uh, be able to see where they are before they can operate the drone. Uh, we participate um, uh, with U.S. Forest Services and and Air um, uh, Civil Air Patrol uh, to test out some of this functionality of this kit, and it is it has been a very good in 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 reception of that. So we're hoping uh, to be able to deploy that more, uh, and then uh, hopefully that the U.S. Uh, Forest Services will will take that for the future uh, acquisition. Um, and the third thing, the third thing is that uh, I I thought it was really useful to see more use cases and more um, acceptance of the public on on drone, right? So you know we're talking about so that company that using drone to deliver uh, medical and also especially in Africa and other uh, third world country using drone uh, as part of their uh, medical uh, uh, delivery, and I thought that that was a really um, good for the 2023. Outstanding, outstanding. Uh, can So for those that are listening, I know we've got a lot of people on YouTube right now, a lot of people out there. By the way, these are the experts. You can pick their brains. So send notes in the chat or just say hello. Tell us where you're from. This is live. Uh, I've been taking copious notes because I want to follow up on some of these things. Uh, this is not really scripted. Uh, I'm hearing these answers just as you are for the first time. Um, and I, I love what I'm hearing. For those that are not super familiar with the drone industry, uh, UTM is UAS traffic management. It's that low altitude uh, air, airspace management system that's going to be separate but loosely connected to air traffic control, connected insofar as when it needs to be, right? So that's what we're talking about. A lot of research on the NASA side there. And the NASA is the National Airspace System. Uh, and integrating drones into that is obviously the key thing that FAA and NASA in support is trying to do. Um, so I have a question for you, Hui, if you're allowed to tell us, and, and you probably did announce this publicly, but I may have missed it. So for your UTM um, trials that you're going to be doing in the future, you said there was a key site announced. Where Can you tell, share with us where that location is? Uh, I don't know. Well, I think they are working um, to get the clearance to for that announcement for the key site. Okay. Uh, they are they are looking at couple a, a few just and and it's not you know it's not secret or anything. It's just that we need to make sure that the key site would so would have the characteristic and the airspace that we need in order to make the UTM research. Uh, reality, right? Uh, yeah. And also the acceptance of, of, of that kind of research. But we're also looking at the key side, what we call as a living lab, which means that once we we are setting this infrastructure up and we're hoping that it, even after we're done, it will remain so that industry, academic, and, and other government agency can continue to use it as a way to improve of the technology so that that's why we call it the key side but in my view we, we call it the the, the living living lab so that we could continue to improve and continue to um, to deploy new technology and be able to test it out before you know it go into operations okay excellent so you guys all heard it here first keep your eyes peeled for that announcement of the location of the key site where they're going to be doing utm trials and and frankly, you know, the wildfire, I mean, the world has been on fire. We and, and Kevin, we both know this. Drones have played such a critical role in helping and but but like a limited role. Right. Because so much more like this traffic management or deconfliction of airspace 
needs to really be um, hammered out before there they can be kind of more common and accepted use even in wildland fires. And by the way, fun fact, I'm uh, I just wrote an article in, inside Unmanned Systems magazine, uh, and we're going to talk about the Acero program NASA has here shortly. Uh, but I do highlight that uh, about wildfires and drones. So also check that out coming coming to you uh, your inbox hopefully shortly. Uh, Kevin, uh, back to you. Uh, and again, if you can't answer this, just just don't. That's fine. I, you know, I'm, I'm deviating from some of the stuff we talked about. But you raised a couple things. Um, one is your part 137 streamlined process. So yay. I guess my question is, do you see that as being kind of like a, a model that, that could be applicable to other complex operations? Like for example, 135 for drone delivery, right? Like, um, so the, I mean, the agricultural spraying has so many concerns, you know, including EPA and, and all this other, you know, all these other concerns. Um, do you expect maybe there could be something hypothetically in the future applicable to some of these other complex ops based on just the lessons learned that you guys uh, gained from the 137, you know, um, expedited process, if you will? Yeah, absolutely. And and I, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Don. The, the really cool thing about drones which also kind of makes it challenging is that everything we do is kind of new. Uh, so, so everything that we as team is working on, everything that the FA is working on, hasn't really been done before. So we, we take a look at the part 137 agricultural operations as a, as a prime example. Uh, I mentioned before, traditionally there is this multi-step process and we have acronyms for it, but I'm going to spare everyone FA acronyms right now. But there was a long process that you went through with your local flight standards district office to get certified and that worked really well for traditional aircraft. But of course, drones aren't traditional aircraft. They're, they're very different. So I think what, what you're seeing is the FAA taking a look at always the risk of the environment, the operation, the mission, and then tailoring our processes to meet that risk. And so part 137 is a great example of that. So what we've done is we said, look, maybe we don't have to do all this because this, this isn't a traditional aircraft. This, this is a drone aircraft. And so maybe this process will work. So let's try it out. Let's see how it goes. And then we mm -hmm. always collect data from everything that we do. And we go back and we look at it and say, can this be applied elsewhere? Can this be applied to perhaps waivers? Can this be applied or this process be used for exemptions? And then maybe even ultimately, can we use a similar process for certificating part 135 operators? Um, part 135 operations are more complex than drones and granted they're not spraying chemicals, but they have a different set of challenges that go along with them. So maybe it will and maybe it won't work. But I think the exciting part is that you're seeing the FAA adapt and maybe we don't adapt as fast as many people would like, but there's a reason for our, our gradual movement through this process because we have to continually ensure safety. But with part 137, great example of the FAA adapting to a, a change and making that change better and more efficient for the operator and the user and then also maybe looking at that data down the road and saying, maybe this will work for other types of operations. I love that. And I, and I love the summary grants that you're doing now and those four specific waivers, you know, that was published in the federal register. Anybody could read it. They could have the opportunity to comment on it before you guys finally approve those. Um, you know, I'm hoping, you know, that this will be more kind of commonplace because uh, the, um, the FAA waiver website they ha you guys have the approved waivers on there, which is yay. And by the way, I love your website. And NASA's too. I'm not just saying that. I mean, I think you guys, your, your teams do a great job of putting out all the critical information. The only thing I'd say about the, the waivers is I would love, and I get the proprietary nature of some things, uh, you know, those attachments or the actual con ops were never attached to those waivers. So you have more of the rote like, these are the operational parameters that you can basically perform under. Um, I'm hoping in the future, given your success with these four waivers, that maybe that will be more commonplace where we we'll actually get to essentially see the sausage being made. And I know a lot of companies are probably hesitant to do that, but you know what? There, as they say, a rising uh, tide raises all ships, right? Like yeah. the success of, you know, Phoenix, uh, uh, you know, unmanned, 
uh, is really could be as in the case of this waiver, one of those waivers could be the success of everybody. And, and I love that you guys are taking that approach. So, so great job. Let's transition to AAM. Uh, and before I ask you the question about the top three, let's roll a quick video. The FAA has released a blueprint for future air taxi operations in the nation's airspace. At first, air taxis will operate using existing routes and helipads used by helicopters today, following the same rules as other aircraft. As operations increase, the air taxis could fly in designated corridors. Initially, pilots will be on board and actively fly the aircraft. Pilots see and avoid other aircraft and coordinate with air traffic controllers. Air taxis likely will operate one way only within the established corridors set first. But as air taxis increase in number and complexity, strategies for two-way traffic could be introduced. In these corridors, operators could be responsible for keeping aircraft safely separated using industry-developed technologies and FAA-approved rules. This blueprint is a key step in the FAA's work to safely usher in this next era of aviation. I'll tell you what, uh, drones are super cool, but I have a huge heart for electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft and air taxis of the future. And I don't know, just looking around this past year, I just feel like there's just been news pop, pop, popping all over the place in that particular arena. And uh, I'm going to start this time with Hui, and then we'll go to you, Kevin. Um, lots going on, obviously, in advanced air mobility. Uh, in particular on the eVTOL side of the house. Uh, you guys have been doing things for years, you know, the national campaign, uh, you know, the uh, ecosystem workshops, et cetera. As you look back on this year, Hui, what would you say the top three AAM developments have been? Yeah, I actually, I think 2023, probably one of the most exciting year for, for AAM and, and the, the industry itself, right? You start seeing uh, Joby flying, um, uh, Beta in flying. I mean, and, and, in New yeah, York. Yeah, in New York, right, right. I mean, that is just, it, it just so exciting, you know, so exciting to see Archer is flying and almost like all major um uh, oem in this uh in this area is starting to build the aircraft starting to fly it you know we heard a lot about it for years now but they finally operating in the system and thanks to the faa to at least give them some approval so that they can start flying in new york um so you can see that the future is very bright um, so I think that is exciting. Uh, we also see that the uh, the Department of Defense now looking also now looking at a, this kind of vehicle for their services, right? And he actually is another excitement because we all know that that's how aviation gets started, right? We started with, with aviation with mail carrying first, before, delivering first before it become commercialized. So I think we, we, with the governmental and commercial, we're we putting our head together, um, different use case, but it's, it's in an exciting time. Uh, and we also working with industry on how are we going to, again, integrate it into the airspace. Now, this vehicle is going to fly higher than 400 feet, unlike the UAS, uh, the small UAS going to fly into um, to our airspace. How are we going to in integrating them and allow what I call routine scalable operation, not just one off. What we've seen uh, this year in New York, great but it's still a one-off, right? We right. use, um, but we want it to be able to scale it, you know, and that's the only way that we can make air taxi affordable for all, for all people, not just the, a few. So I think that's very exciting. Um, and then you're also seeing other use case for, for AAM. It could be used for what I call a medical, right? How bringing, bringing doctor from, from city to rural area to help 
you know, to, to help that community. So I'm seeing this so many public good use case that can enable this industry to grow and to become um, more um, uh, uh, an everyday uh, mode of transportation, taking a 2D transportation, which is we're driving, right, to a 3D transportation and utilizing all of the altitude that the FAA allow us to do. <laughs> to yeah, use. you know, absolutely. I, you know, Kat, this is probably not as exciting for Kevin in a way because you're already a pilot, right? So, but for me, like this year was so big for me because I got this. Well, actually, I guess it was a little towards the end of last year. I got to see the unveiling of Archer's Midnight aircraft, but also the the transitional flight of the Maker, uh, which mm -hmm. was their prototype. But then this year uh at the nbaa the national business aviation associations uh, business aviation conference and expo bace in vegas i got to see the volocopter fly the the velocity mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh at the henderson airport i was standing there with tony drummond uh and monica cambra and we were just like our mouths were open we're like oh my gosh like so so incredibly cool it's one thing to see a picture or a video it's another thing to see these things live in action just amazing so kevin faa has been doing a lot chipping away at aam trying to facilitate all these different flights and demos and and uh sandboxes if you will uh tell us what you think are the top three in aam this year well don i and hui i i wholeheartedly agree on the excitement level of, of aam i you know it's it's one of those things that you, to talk about it, you know, these these are going to fly and you see a picture and this is how we think it's going to work to actually seeing them fly and operate, I, I think really brings it home. If, it, if that doesn't get you excited about the future aviation, I really don't know what might. Uh, so so this, this has just been a really exciting year too for the FAA when it comes to AAM. There's there's a few things that we've done that I'll, I think are worth the highlighting here. Uh, one is that in July, we released our AAM implementation plan, uh, which we call Innovate 28. And a lot of things that Hui was mentioning about the, the, the broadening of the operation and making them routine and scalable and economical and viable, um, that sort of fits into the FAA's Innovate 28 plan. And, and we call it Innovate 28 because the idea is that by 2028, which is about to be only four years away or less, right? I know. Uh, that we are going to have routine AAM operations. They may not be at scale in 28, but a goal is to have those routine operations operating by 2028. And if you haven't had a chance to read the Innovate 28 plan and, and you like AAM, take a read. It's pretty cool. It, it will literally draw out the roadmap, where our benchmarks are, how this is going to work, not only that, but it talks about the massive collaboration. And I know we touched on this a bit that has to happen between not only government to government, FAA and NASA, but also industry, OEMs, manufacturers of these aircrafts, uh, the support mm -hmm. structure. Uh, Vertiports is a word that's been thrown around the last couple of years. How is that going to fit in? How is the electrical grid going to support these types of aircraft that are EV tall? Um, that's all part of that Innovate 28 plan. It's really, really cool. Um, now, on to a couple other points I want to make, and these are more pen and paper type, but they're massive uh, milestones, if you will. The first one is we, we updated and published the final rule to incorporate powered lift into our Part 135, our air carrier definitions, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, why that's such a big deal is that uh, air carriers, Part 135, 121, um, they were restricted to certain types of aircraft by their definition. So in order to bring EV tall into that realm, we had to change the definition, which sounds super easy. But if you've been involved with FAA rulemaking, nothing is super easy with FAA <laughs> rulemaking. So really, yeah. I, I'm really glad to see that we got that done. We published that final rule. Another one was a proposed rule that we published, and this is going to bring in the piloting aspect of it. So how are pilots going to fly these? How are the pilots requirements going to be set to fly these? And how are we going to train pilots, the initial cadre of pilots that go out to fly these EV tall aircraft, how does it all work? So I, I think just building on what we had said with our Innovate 28 plan, the final rule, rule we issued on powered lift and the air carrier ops and the proposed rule on pilot training, I mean, we're really moving forward. We always say crawl, walk, run, but it seems like this part is moving really quickly and, and for good measure because this stuff is really cool. Well. 
correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, I, and I might be, uh, but this month in December, aren't there supposed to be some flights happening in the Dallas Metroplex area? Not just drones, but also maybe advanced air mobility like EV tolls. Uh, and I forget what that that initiative was called, but um, you know, kind of that start. And and it's you know interesting because it's outside of what we would cons- you know the the designated official test sites that Congress designated by law. Uh, it's it's outside of the Beyond program which is focused primarily on drones uh, and beyond visual line of sight. Um, so is that, is that happening this month or, uh, and it doesn't include AAM um, EV tolls? Yeah, so the, the, I, what we're talking about the, the field test sites or the operational test sites, that's part of the UTM implementation plan. And that's something that we, again, put out earlier this year, but it calls for those types of field test locations to be established and go uh, in terms of drones to do some of the work that's required for UTM for drones so that we can gather data on that. So that data gathering is in process. Uh, we're, we're taking a look at all these test sites and trying to figure out if we should establish more or take a look at what we've got there. But you know, we had mentioned before, it's uh, creating a, a field test location is a lot more challenging than saying, hey, we want to put it here. Uh, because oh, yeah. Have- you want to be able to create a location that's going to encompass as much diversity in airspace, traffic management, infrastructure, everything else, so that you don't have to recreate that test in a different environment because you, you missed a, a box to check over here. So um, that the field tests for our UTM implementation are underway. We're going to take a look at that data as it comes to us and help us formulate our long-term plan with UTM. Okay, awesome. Uh... I, I think Texas was announced. I don't think I'm letting any cats out of the bag there. I think it was at your FAA drone symposium slash AAM summit that occurred in August. I just remember hearing that. Uh, and I remember hearing something about December. That's why I was kind of bringing it up since we are in December. Um, do you, any, any updates on that? Or, or I don't mean to put you on the spot, but that was just my memory of, of that. Yeah, uh, so we're in the process of gathering the data from those test sites. Uh, you know, you mm-hmm. mentioned Dallas. So I don't really have any updates to bring for you on that yet, but I have a feeling when we do this next year, yeah. we'll probably have some recap of those test sites. Okay, all right, yeah. gotcha. gotcha. <laughs> speaking, of, speaking of test sites, we've got Mark Genug from uh, the Nevada test site. He has a question. How can the UAS test sites better enable your efforts? Um, I'll, I'll let we take that one first, unless you want me to tackle that one. Well, you know, we, we've done uh, TCL4 in, in, in Nevada, uh, downtown Nevada, actually. And, and you know, uh, it was a really good collaboration between city and, uh, gov- and federal government level uh, side. Uh, I, think, um, I think for the UTMBV laws, like Kevin said, we have to we have to make sure that we have all the characteristic uh, in a test side that we can we can enable uh, for the future and answer all the research questions that we have. Um, so, um, and and I'm and Kevin probably can address better than I can. Uh, but right now, um, we are working on that plan, and 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 hopefully we can share with you later um, in 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 the next uh, next calendar year. And speaking of which, uh, shameless plug for my Law Tech Connect workshop next year with AEVSI Exponential on Monday, April twenty second. That website is already live. If you want to register now, we also have scholarships. But Kevin, hopefully, God willing, there's a budget and it can actually come. Uh, <laughs> he's going to be on our faculty. Uh, talking about uh, which one? Oh, you're the global drone regulations uh, representing the U.S. perspective. Um, but we're also having an AAM panel uh, and state of the states. So we're going to have a couple of these test site folks uh, talking about their efforts. So definitely come and check it out. It's going to be awesome. Kevin, we're running short on time. I knew this, you know, look, we, we just did the top three and we're already at like 935 mountain time. Uh, so here's what I want to do. Number one, I want to backtrack and, and just mention that the UTM trials that we was talking about in the context of wildland firefighting, it's part of the ACERO program. It's called the Advanced Capabilities for Emergency Response Operations. 
it's much bigger than just that kit she was talking about for airspace deconfliction. So check mm -hmm. out the NASA website. We're not going to be able to dig deep into that now. What I want to do is pivot just for a second. I mean, we've been alluding to it, but since this is kind of like the look back and look forward show, I, I want to ask both of you, as we kind of get close to the end here, because this has been great. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for your perspectives and uh, for all the progress this year uh, from both of your agencies. It's been, it's just been spectacular to watch that obviously hand in hand with industry uh, people out, out there really charging hard. Um, I guess my question for both of you is as you look forward to 2024, what would you say the top three things are, if you can even fit them in the time we've left uh, that you, that you see coming down the pike? I can think in my own head what it would um, I could see. And you can combine drone and AAM. We're not going to have time to break those out. Uh, so, Kevin, let's start with you. Okay. I, I think in the interest of time, I'll combine drone and AAM here. But um, for me, I, I think for drones next year, I, you're really going to see uh, the expansion of BV loss. Um, I, won't con I won't commit to say that there'll be rulemaking. But it's no secret that we've had an ARC, an Aviation Rulemaking Committee, rulemaking committee on BV loss out there, and we've received the final report of that. We're taking a look at these exemptions for BV loss. We're using them as summary grants. For the first time ever, we started to do operations like package delivery, BV loss, without the use of visual observers. That just recently happened. And that's, that's really cool advanced type stuff. So I think for drones for next year, I would expect to see a lot more on BB loss is what everybody in the industry is hoping for. It's what a lot of us in the FAA are working very digital, diligently towards. So for me, that that's probably going to be a big thing for drones. I think for, for AAM, you're going to start to see more of the operational aspects of it. We're going to get into more of the airworthiness criteria for drones moving away, perhaps from special airworthiness certificates into full-fledged airworthiness certificates, which will be one of the next big steps we have towards the sort of routine scalable operation of AAM. But either way, uh, 2024 is going to be an exciting year. Awesome. Yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to it. Hui, how about you? What, do, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, so I think I, I think 2024 is going to be a really exciting year, like Kevin said. I mean, it's, you know, the NASA and the FAA, we are now walk hand in hand together in this area of research and operations, right? Um, so for drone, I'm hoping that um, in 2024, we set up the, the key site and started to do some preliminary um, uh, uh, flight tests, um, look, looking at, you know, capability development and also, uh, and, and also working with the FAA on, on providing them requirement for the rulemaking. We don't make rule, FAA does. We provide the data as needed. Um, for AAM, I think it's going to be a huge year for AAM. I think that we're going to start looking at, you know, right already, we are already working with industry and FAA on uh, acoustic acoustic measurement uh, to, to evaluate the noise issue for, for the future. We want to make sure that these vehicles are capable of, of low noise, uh, but also, you know, how are we going to integrate them uh, into uh, uh, the airspace? That is important. And, and we can, and we help, we would want to help the industry to, to be able to what we call as uh, using UAM airspace as a services. It, the FAA does not have the, cap have the funding to provide centralized services for all of this airspace, right, uh, management. So can we help to provide research results so that company can come in and start provide that kind of management as, as a services and the FAA act as, uh, as a policy maker and uh, not enforcer, but, you know, checking uh, and balances. And the next thing I, I think that's going to be exciting and actually we, uh, we're hoping to get it uh, go, come, uh, going is, um, is wire file. You know, uh, we wanted to make sure uh, what we, we are hoping to do is developing uh, concept of operation, interagency kind of operation to uh, to start uh, the feasibility of what we call second shift. You know, can we do uh, aerial suppression 
uh, during a uh, derated condition or even in, at night. That's when the fire uh, is the most calm. So can we do that with remotely operated vehicle or autonomous vehicle? So that kind of thing, I think you're going to start seeing in 24. Um, and I think it's going to set it up for a, a, a 25, 26, 27 and beyond. And hopefully uh, by 2030, we would see a scalable operation of UAM, AAM, you know, drone and all that. So yeah, I, I love the, the comment you made earlier about the Department of Defense and, and you know, some of this work with eVTOLs. So we saw Beta Technologies delivering their ALIA or ALIA aircraft uh, to the Air Force this year at Edwards mm -hmm. Air Force Base. I think Joby delivered their first one uh, shortly behind that and um, agree it's a, it's a huge stepping stone to certification on the FAA side to prove out that safety case on the DOD side as well. So a uh, lot lots going on there uh really exciting times i was actually involved we back in 2013 with the california rim wildfire and we put our uh i think it was a predator up uh california national guard and, and that was a really really big deal uh mm -hmm. but to your point it was it it it, it enabled 24 7 operations for the first time uh yeah. at, at night you know those firefighters were the hugest fans of like we could actually work and, and help suppress this fire in a way that we've never been able to do before. So uh, long time in the making, I'm looking forward to all of this future progress as well. Uh, in the couple minutes we have left, I wanna give each of you the opportunity for some closing remarks uh, as we close out the show, as we close out the year and blast into 2024 together. So uh, Hui, let's go with you, uh, your closing comments. Yeah, thank you for inviting uh, me back to this, and and I really appreciate the the, the audience taking that time to to listen to us. Uh, but I, like I said, I think that the U.S. need to maintain the leadership in this area. We do want to harmonize with uh, at the global uh, uh, at the global level, but at the same time, I think that. UTM started here, air traffic, we have a good air traffic management system and the safest probably in the world. Um, so I think we need to stay in the forefront of that. And, and as a government entity working with the FAA and other agency, we want to ensure that US leadership in this area uh, for our economic growth in the future. Awesome, thank you so much, Kevin. Yeah, I, I think I'll say one word, but repeat it a few times. Collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. If, if you've been listening to this uh, podcast, live broadcast here, and you're hearing nothing else, you have to understand the amount of collaboration it takes and that we are doing. So we've brought this up numerous times. Don, you have well between the FAA and NASA, but there's so many other government agencies also involved in this endeavor. And then you get outside of government and it's even a broader spectrum of industry and individuals engaged in this. So we, as mentioned, our, our air traffic system, we, we have the most complex and yet the safest air traffic system in the world. And we definitely want to keep it that way, but we don't live in a bubble in doing so. So it takes a, a group effort. It takes the pilots, the mechanics, the companies and manufacturers, the organizers, the other government agencies all working together to keep this thing going, let alone bring in something as new and as exciting as AAM, which we're going to do and it's going to be successful. So Don, thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure to speak with you and we on this topic. I look forward to this every year. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if this was Sesame Street, I think this production was brought to you by the letter C, collaborate. I think the two of you are a living example of that. Uh, you know, and, and Kevin, I'll tell you what, the collaboration that I've seen across industry this year has been unprecedented. Companies that you would think are rivals uh, are partnering together. And uh, in fact, it was just yesterday on Twitter now, now uh, for the, the app formerly known as Twitter, now X, um, where I saw Archer go out and say, hey, we're, we're collaborating with Beta on charging stations. And I was like, better together always. And people started harding my thing because yes, you know, collaboration is key, and, and we've seen that this year. We've seen that with both of you. And, and we, of course, we want to thank both of you for taking the time out of your incredibly busy schedules uh, to spend this time with us and give us this year in review. So much we weren't able to cover, everybody. Go to the FAA website. Go to the NASA website. Check that out. Any other ways for them to contact you or places where 
you think they should go to learn more about the FAA and NASA's efforts? Hui, you first. Well, I'm going to be in CES 2024. So if you're there, look me, uh, look me up and uh, we, can, we, can, we can collaborate some more. Kevin. I'm going to miss CES this year, which is a shame, but uh, you can find me usually at AUVS Size Exponential, the commercial UAV Expo. You can also find me online. I'm the person answering our Facebook messages on our Drone Zone account. So you can always reach me there too, but just follow us on our social media accounts or check our websites. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much, everybody. We are out here. Thank you.